everybody, and welcome back to Beware the Artist. I am Jeremy Jersa, and today I have with me Katie Sable. Um, Katie, how are you? I'm great. Hi, Jeremy. It's uh, really good to finally meet. Thanks for inviting me on. So um, for everybody at home listening and watching, um, who are you and what do you do? So um, I'm a painter, and I live and work just outside of D.C. in Reston, Virginia with my family. I have three kids. Um, I grew up in southwestern Virginia, actually, and I um, got my BFA in studio art um, at Virginia Tech. And then I ended up moving to D.C. and um, getting my MFA from American University in, oh, goodness, 2009. So I've been in Northern Virginia, I guess, for like, what, 11 years. Um, my primary painting practice is an exploration of, I guess, the material through process-less abstraction. So I've always had this, like, really strong interest in repetition and, and generally in geometric abstraction. But... Um, I guess my compositions over the last couple of years have really moved away from being an all over pattern based or more rigid geometric and now they've become far softer or more organic arenas and they're sort of they're still heavily filled with that geometric fretwork I guess but like shapes um, are still within like a pretty shallow or restricted uh, space so I'm really driven by um, those tensions between, I guess you'd say like analytical and intuitive mark making and the surface of the painting is really that like most important element to me. So I spend a lot of time reacting, responding to things that are happening in the painting process. And that's, um, and, and I'm an oil painter, I guess I should, should have said that from the start, but that's my, I, I primarily work in, in oil, but sometimes I'll work in gouache or every now and again, uh, acrylic on paper or something, but mostly oil paint. So as an artist that primarily works in abstraction, what parameters are you really kind of putting in place in order to generate uh, the imagery that you're working with? Oh, that's a good question. So for me, I guess this, this really gets down to, I think it's a conversation about starts, like starting paintings for me, because, because the, so much of the process is led by the doing and the making. I think for me, I try not to rule out too many things as I'm starting a painting. So I'm often motivated by something that is could be a very simple snippet, right? It could be a color relationship I, I want to explore. It could be a phrase or a song lyric, or it could be you know a wallpaper motif from my childhood bedroom or, or whatever, a quirky shape or combinations of shapes or you know wanting something to feel heavy, wanting something to feel sexy, wanting something to feel like nighttime, you know, whatever the motivation is. I think that um, it's important for me to just throw it out there, right? And, and then the painting will begin to reveal itself as I'm working. So, so I guess what I've found is that I don't at the start of a painting really ever feel too precious, right? Mm. So for me, it's okay to just throw it out there, see what sticks and then begin responding and evaluating and navigating through that process to find the painting or let the paint, painting reveal the magic or whatever. So, yeah. How important to you in this process is the surface? Because as I look through your images, I think some of my, my favorite ones are where I can kind of see the history and I see the paint start to layer and then I'll see maybe a, uh, you know, one shape of a solid color, but underneath of that, I can see the strokes of the history of this painting. So yeah. do you want to speak to that a little it's, bit? It's absolutely, I think, one of my primary motivations in, in my work. Like it, that, that nails a lot of the things that um, excite me the most in my studio is that archive, I guess, of it. Like you're sort of revealing at some point that, that this other thing was going on and you're veiling it. But at the same time, is it still important? It is. It's all important. I love, you know, it, it, it all matters to me in that regard. But you sort of are in this, I've, I've always been in this editing process. And I think a lot of that has to do with that. I think that everything, I wanna put everything in a painting. Every time I'm looking, I want, I want it all in there and, and I can't do that. So I have to like, you know, say, oh, nope, nope. Let's pull back. What are you really, what are the, what are the best things going on here? And how can you make those things be the painting? And then the other parts of it, the process part of it is really what supports you know, the whole entirety of the image. So, but yeah, the surface, it's, it's, it's such a, a thing for me. And I, and I hate that about images, or I, I love that you say that because images, I think sometimes really do fall flat and they don't show, you know, that side angle where you see, you know, this 
lovely geometric sitting on top of a, a gloppy drip that's behind it. And somehow you're expecting it to be this, you know, rigid, beautiful, perfect line, but then under is this completely messy glob or, or whatever. So, so those kinds of things, those little, that, those little dancing moments are really exciting to me. Yeah, I think, uh, I think what you're bringing up is, is kind of this idea of, uh, you know, paintings for painters almost. It, it becomes kind of painting porn in a certain Yeah, it's absolutely. Certain, yeah. No, it really is. I say this all the time that like, I love when someone walks up to my painting and like, gets that quirky little painter joke, right? Like, they're, like you know that they're a painter if they're like, ah, oh, look at that. Like, <laughs> she did that little thing, look at that. Like, and, and love that little, or, or find something funny or something luscious about a painting because it's painting. So yeah, absolutely. And uh, ab ab abstraction is one of those rare moments um, in today's society where, where people can project themselves into a painting. They can come up with their own themes, their own narratives, and really have themselves uh, in that moment. Um, but some of your titles, they like, uh, for example, Don't Hate Me Until After the Party or uh, The Little Death, they kind <laughs> of allude to a specific narrative. Um, how important is it to you that the audience is aware of whatever reference you're making? Right. That, it, that's an interesting question. And, and I love talking about the titles. The titles are, are really important to me. Um, but I, I think it gets down to, gosh, if I can think this through well, um, that I want to re reward viewership, I guess, in the work, in the work, like, mm -hmm. over time, you're, you're spending time with my paintings, right? And, and, and maybe you eventually get that reward. It, it, it doesn't have to be, I don't want it to be easy for you to get there, right? Like, I think I often make work um, um, not to soothe the viewer. I'm okay with you being uncomfortable, but eventually I do hope that, that, that you will find that reward, right? Mm -hmm. So in that same thread of thinking, um, I think that my references, my motivations, whatever whatever it may be that I'm making the painting for, right, or what got me driven to, to make that mark, I think that as long as those motivations are authentic or interesting, that can somehow come through in the work. So because those titles can sort of act as, or those motivations, they act for me as like false starts or great starts or whatever they are, what the titles end up doing is being, I think, sort of like conversation starters in a way, right? So it's funny because my titles are really important to me, but I don't have a formula for like how I get to them. Sometimes they reveal themselves at the beginning of a painting. Sometimes I have to think about it um, after the painting is complete. Sometimes I start a painting with a title in mind and sometimes it sticks and then the painting turns into something else and, and then it becomes a pet name for the pa for the <laughs> painting. And then I come up with a new name, that's the official name, but then I still call it the pet name. Like, you know, they're, they're this, 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 this conversation starter, I think is an idea. Like before I've formulated what the hell is happening in the painting, there sort of becomes these little, these little, these little snippets, these little phrases. And I think they do function in a way that sort of starts the conversation. And I think that's valuable because it allows me to be able to show a little bit more of that vulnerability mm -hmm. and reveal a little bit more of my work in a concrete way without having to be like didactic. Like I'd hate to stand in front of a painting and be like, this painting was about this and here are the eight things that I was doing and I hope that you got that out of it. You know, no, like I, I, I want you to walk up to it and I do want you to be rewarded, but I think that you bring that. Like, you, you know, hopefully I've, Hopefully I've presented it and, and it's something that's interesting to look at, but it's up to the viewer to, to go from there, I guess. Yeah, if that even answers the question. Oh, I think, <laughs> I think it does completely. Um, okay. the, the way you kind of, you talk about your paintings, they, they have a certain physicality to it. Um, are, do, you, do you think of them as kind of the, do you think of them in the contextual kind of window of your entering this kind of other space or do you see them as this physical object this physical presence within the room that you're kind of altering i love that question honestly because i definitely absolutely don't see them as spaces i think see see them as things mm -hmm. I, I see them as as an object and it's interesting because i i think that's all just intuitively where i'm interested when i'm working i'm not 
so I don't desire to find illusionistic moments in the painting. I'm not looking for building space or having, I, I mean, I love figure ground relationships and playing back and forth with that, that push and pull of like, whether it comes forward, whether it goes back. I'm just not interested in, in giving it this deep space. I really love the perimeter of like a very shallow space. And I think that that relates to me. Like I think of them as these chunky things that sit on the wall and that's it, they're that shallow. And that whole space, like I, I, I talk a lot about scale, I think too in my work, I think a lot about scale because the, the large paintings to me very much relate to my size and of my body and I'm you know pulling them down and working with them on the floor and then getting them back up and putting them on the wall and they are these things that I'm manipulating and then at the same time I have these smaller pieces that I'm doing that I think of as like they're, they're more diaristic they're these you know small little intimate drawings that I'm, I'm still either working on an easel or on the table I'm still doing that up and down thing but it's more intimate and so for me, I, I do think that that, that uh, physicality, that objectness is really important, even though they're paintings and they're two dimensional, it's like they're things to me. So you started to touch on this a little bit, but what exactly is, is happening in the studio while you're working? Um, is there music playing? Are there podcasts? Is there Netflix in the background? Um, are you working on the wall? Are you working on the floor? Are you totally. throwing these canvases around? What's, what's going on? All of that. <laughs> no. Um, so I definitely, the one thing, I definitely don't look, can't listen to podcasts in the studio. I don't know what it is. And I, I have actually tried because I... I, you know, it's, it's a great to have that conversation going on and be thinking in that way. But I, I think for me, I just, I've learned that music is the only way for me to access a certain headspace, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I need to get into a certain place. I need to be able to get to a certain place in my head to process what I'm going to do. And music gets me there better than anything else. But at the same time, I'm super particular about my playlist. So that's actually part of my process is like going down into the studio. I spend some time like drawing, looking at the work. And then I kind of think about what needs to happen for the day. Like what are my objectives or goals? And, and it's funny because I, I, I'm pretty laid back in the studio. I don't have a really clean and perfect space. It's kind of messy. It's kind of crazy. But I am picky about like, the way I begin working for the day. Like I start with sort of a set level of, you know, plan for what I'm going to do. And then I set the playlist in a way like to that, like, oh, I need to like be thinking about this kind of thing. And so I'll sit for 20. It's like, you know, what is the, I feel like I read it, saw a meme recently that was joking about how it takes just as long for you to like sit there and pick out your Netflix show for the night that you can spend like an hour looking on what yeah. you're going to watch by the time, you know, the, that's kind of how I am with my playlist. Like they're really, really important to me. But then once I get going, um, then I loosen up a little bit and then it becomes sort of like whatever happens for the day. My goals always fly out the window. I always end up just rolling with it. And then I'll end up having, you know, mix some great color that was supposed to go here because that's been the plan all along. And then that was a really shitty idea. So then I move on to putting it on another painting and it totally throwing that painting into a great space. And so, so I'm really all over the place. And I think I need to be because as I talked about before, just being someone who puts, wants to put everything in one painting by working on multiple pieces, by throwing around a bunch of mm. surfaces and having a bunch of stuff going on, it really helps, you know, sort of like self editing in a way. But then as I get closer to one painting being complete, like I can tell like, oh, this magical little moment happened, right? Like I'm really excited about this. Then I have to almost just like turn the, you know, the other pieces to the side and just zone in on one painting. So, you know, I kind of am all over the place with it for a while, but then I do kind of really hone in. And that's just kind of a process that's worked for me, you know, having lots of stuff going on and then focusing. So you, you've talked a, a lot about having these multiple canvases kind of around you and, and working on multiple surfaces. Um, how long does kind of one of these pieces sit and then come back into it or turn around and then and then come back into the conversation? What's that like? Right. It's funny because I, I've, I think about this a lot because I'm always it as we're talking like it, it, I, 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 I describe so easily the um, 
this part of the process in which it's all very intuitive and it's all very, you know, like I'm going with it, right? And I'm led by a mark or something excites me and it leads me over here and I'm bing, bing, bing. I'm like a ping pong ball, right? Like, so I've got that going on, but then there's also this important part of my process, which relates to sitting and looking. And so I spend a lot of time analyzing, overanalyzing the work, overthinking about a mark that I'm about to make as well. Like I'll make, it's funny, I'll make a really intuitive, quick, like brash decision that I know is going to ruin the painting and I'm going to have to fix it. But I know I have to break it in order to fix it to get it to that next place, right? So I allow that to be something that I do, but I also can get really, you know, sit back and be stuck in a way. So I, I think that um, having multiple surfaces going on gives, I, I, there's been one or two, I mean, three or four occasions in the last year, maybe, where I left something for like two months and didn't look at it, turned it around, forgot it was there, and then turned it over and worked on it for a day because it's now it's been formed by five other things that I've been doing. And then I can wrap a painting up that way. And those magical, fun little surprises are exciting, but it doesn't happen often. I think I almost like I'm grueling. I overwork. I overthink the pieces. I spend a lot of time with them all. And they all sort of have their own rhythm. I think that the difference between the larger work and the smaller work is interesting because a lot of people would assume that smaller work is finished faster, right? Or that because these are small, intimate, more like diaristic, you know, intimate entries, these like one-off, one thought, you know, paintings, these little guys, right? They, you'd, you'd think that that would mean they were faster. They came across in like two passes, but it's more that I think I'm like recording the idea. I get it on there, but I still spend a lot of time kind of sledging through. And I guess that's just part of the natural part of the process is I'm working through layers. Layers need time to dry. I need to be able to scrape. I need to be able to lay something on top. There's that pragmatic aspect of it. But then the larger pieces can be, you know, a six month painting as well. Like I'll spend six mm -hmm. months on, on a larger painting, maybe longer. But in that process, I think I allow the evolution of the idea to go with me that moves more in those six months where mm -hmm. the smaller pieces like the almost like the initial motivation doesn't change as much as the bigger pieces like the bigger pieces feel like they're these broad ever moving ever shifting ever growing concept while the smaller pieces you know sort of stay in their box I guess I don't know if that <laughs> but yeah that's it's you know, they, they all seem to get a lot of time with me. <laughs> it's a so uh, you, you also, you minored in art history. Um, does did. any of that uh, kind of catalog or Rolodex of art historical knowledge filter into your studio process? You know, I do think that my education, having a strong emphasis in art history plays a big role in my probably in my general way of looking and my general way of evaluating both my work and anything that any anybody else's work that I'm looking at for certain. I wouldn't say that like I actively or purposefully sit down and engage with my work in that like I don't activate that arena necessarily but I know that I'm I'm my understanding, like a deep understanding in certain, and, and where my interests lie, right? Like where any of us, where we're more interested, where we're evaluating in general based on that, that sort of historical context. So I know it's important in my decision-making. I just don't think that I actively am doing it. It's, mm -hmm. it's more intuitive now. So. Um, if there was kind of one work of art that you would like to experience in person, but you haven't had the opportunity to yet, uh, what would that be? Oh my goodness, this is this is hard. I should probably I should have thought about this a little more. It's so funny. Um, I haven't gotten to travel a lot, I would say, and so it'd be really easy. It'd be really easy. I think I would say the Nike of Samothrace, Winged Victory, right? The Hellenistic mm. sculpture. That's in the Louvre, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think it's so. in the Louvre. So uh -huh. that like checks off a hundred other boxes, right? <laughs> if I get to go there to do that, because like I. Hellenistic sculpture is it's so odd because like when I studied and got my minor uh, in art history my my like I, I did my writing intensive and and my final paper on um, Greek um, or it was 
wedding ceremonies as depicted on Greek vases. So I love Greek vases. I since I love anything in that whole realm I was obsessed with and it's still I still am but Hellenistic sculpture is this like small little odd pocket that I think it does for me a thing that I'm thinking about in painting all the time it activates I, I don't know what it is I think it activates in an extreme way for me so like an extreme of emotion and an extreme of um, the fabric folds the weight of the body the, all of that the way it's depicted in those sculptures I think about those things I, I think about extremes a lot in my painting and so I think that that would probably be something that visually seeing in person would like change me right like that would be big. Oh, but then then the Arnolfini portrait. That's another one. I, oh, that's a where good is one. that? I don't know where that is. I'm not like, sure where that in is. In London? Either. I think the National Gallery in Maybe. London. I think so. I don't know, but that one. That's the, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Two. I have two. <laughs> Venus to Milo. Let's keep going. <laughs> anyway. Um, so this is one question that I like to ask um, many, many artists. Um, at what point did you start calling yourself an artist? And at what point did you make the distinction for yourself that this is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life? Okay, so it, I have thought about this so much because I was recently asked something very similarly um, when I was on Erica Hess's um, I Like Your Work podcast. And we ended up having a conversation surrounding something else. I think it might've been about my childhood and like the creativity that I grew up with and how that was supported. And we were having this conversation and I was like, at the end of the day I guess I've always had a studio and Erica was like wait what she's like that's amazing and I was like yeah I really had never thought about it like that mm -hmm. but like my parents like let me take over a room in our basement it wasn't fancy but it was like a whole entire room with a door and and she my I think I was 10 and my mom gave me all her old like oil paints I had to like use like little wrenches to like get the tube like the tops off and they were all grody and had like linseed oil all over mm -hmm. them and and she gave me all her old brushes and my dad I think went to the hardware store and got me a thing of cheap turp and and I started painting and and I made a mess and I was like it was just always okay like I could always carve out this space and so I realized now how lucky that sounds and how lucky I am because I never had that narrative of you need to do something you know this is a great hobby but you need to be pragmatic you need mm. to the, it was like literally never discussed in my house like I it was okay for me to be the kid in high school who was in the back of the classroom drawing instead of worrying about the fact that I didn't get invited to some Friday night party or whatever like I was always that kid and and I you know that seems to be the identity that I recognized from a very early age. So by the time it was like, you know, it's time to go to school or whatever, I think I applied to undergrad with like a declared major as a studio major. Like, I don't think there's a moment in time where I said, that's it guys, I'm, t I'm pursuing this for real. I literally think I just like, it was always gonna be what it was. So I I'm, I'm lucky in that regard, really, mm -hmm. really lucky because I know that's not the story for most, most of us, you yeah, know? That's, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, so with, with that kind of idea of continuing to practice art, uh, many people when they think of artists they, they have this kind of caricature in their head of oh they're daydreaming all day waiting for inspiration um this back and forth idealized version of the artist's life um what is the right. typical day for kate <laughs> it's so funny isn't it this idea that we <laughs> sit around and we're dreaming up when we're gonna walk into the studio and sling the paint around and it's gonna be so fun and it, it's so funny I my good friend Allison is a painter we we were just having this conversation recently and and joking saying the same thing oh that would be so nice wouldn't it <laughs> like that would be so lovely to have this just fun little practice where we go down and dance in the studio and because it entails so much more right mm -hmm. like there's pain there's doubt there's elation there's there's the whole mess of very complicated things surrounding this idea of your studio practice and 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 sustaining a studio practice and so it's so much more dynamic than that it than the the, uh, the caricature would encapsulate like it, it doesn't showcase it at all just how rewarding it is to get your work out there have somebody understand you know something that you're doing it's it's so validating but for me, it, it's, it's hard because I've gone through a very, <clears throat> what do you say, just like a very um, whirlwind tour over the last like 10 years 
I've had very different, I've had studios outside the home, I've had studios in the home, and it's always still been that hustle, like that hustle to get into the studio is, is hard. And the current hustle right now for me is, is the pandemic. Like, um, I, I, you know, once you make all those leaps and bounds and, you know, acrobatics to jump over the laundry pile for me to get into the studio and focus on, on work, like, I'm more efficient now than I ever was before. So my day, if I'm given an hour, I can freaking, I can make use of that hour. Like I can get in there and I can I do the work. And I used to, you know, be like, oh, I have this doctor's appointment at three o'clock. It's going to just destroy my whole studio day is <laughs> ruined. And now I'm like, mm, I got 45 minutes, grab the coffee, get going, you know, put a show on for the kids or whatever. Because I think that's for me, like a, a typical day now is very different than what it was a year ago, because my kids are older. And I was mm -hmm. finally getting to the place like this year was going to be the year that my youngest is in kindergarten. So I would have like five days a week of studio time, um, along with, you, you know, all the other things that, that, that we, we do to, to make ends meet. But like, for, for me, um, I'm dealing with that in a way that I think all of us are, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're all sort of like balancing off different things. And so I am working during the day when I can, putting out fires for the kids, because I'm taking care of their virtual schooling. All three of them are at home, um, doing virtual school. And I have a type one diabetic, my middle kid is. So we're going to stay home for the rest of the year, even if it's likely that maybe they school starts back up or whatever. I think mm -hmm. we're going to stick with virtual for the year just to keep it safe. It seems like a good idea. So we'll be home and they're getting really, they're better at the computer than me at this point with doing, you know, their virtual classroom and stuff. <laughs> so I can, I can try to sneak in the studio, which is adjacent to their workspace and I'm getting a lot of time in that way, but what I used to have would be very much a rigid schedule in which I worked for six hours and I would work out because that's important to me. Like I really need to have that physical energy. I, you know, love to cook and all of these things that were like this scheduled part of my life have, have shifted. So now I paint at night. I paint at night a lot. Like I paint it till three o'clock in the morning some nights because that's the only time I can get that real interrupted mm. time I think if that answers a typical day was different a year ago than it is now and I'm hoping that it will get back to a place where I'm you know able to focus more on the studio but for now you have to roll with it right we're all yeah, yeah. we're all there so yeah um so what is the best advice that you have ever received as an artist or or in general um, yeah. And what is one bit of advice that you would like to pass on to an up and coming uh, class of creatives? Yes. Gosh, I'm sure I can't um, eloquently say this as it was probably said to me, but I remember in grad school, someone just saying, you just show up, like, just, just, just show up. Like, as long as you show up, put the time in. And, and that was that. And, and I'm, I'm sure the context of that was like, get your ass to the studio. That's number one thing. Just get there. The rest will fall into place. And I remember that because like you do run into those times a lot where you can come up with 35 reasons why you should do 20 other things before you, you know, get into the studio. And you don't always feel like it, like because mm -hmm. it isn't this just like fun and exciting thing to it always it, it can it's work and 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 you know that you've got a you know a, a painting ahead that's causing you a lot of you know stress or whatever and so for me I think that what I have learned to do is just like get physically there whether I know it's going to be always effective is not necessarily the that's not the end goal, just mm -hmm. physically be there to physically be with my work as often as I can makes a big difference. And so I know that that's advice. Like I tell, I remind myself all the time that very simple notion. It's not so much about what you need to accomplish when you get there, but just physically get your ass there. But then I would say if I had advice to give on the other end of that, after saying this very valuable thing that I think about <laughs> every day would be at the same time is that like, gosh, there are bad days, right? Like, so the, I, 
give yourself permission, like be kind to yourself, kinder to yourself than, you know, you probably are painting or art in general. It's such a long game, right? Like we're going to be, going to be doing this forever. So <laughs> you, you really have to put in the time, but you also need to surround yourself with the people who support you and believe in you. And that makes a bigger difference than anything, giving yourself grace, giving yourself permission to take the time. Like you've got your whole life. You're not, one painting doesn't define you. It took me mm -hmm. a long time to figure that out, that I could make a shitty painting and still be a committed, you know, mm -hmm. have a committed practice and be a painter and make some, you know, mediocre work sometimes because you got to have it all, you know, you got to. So yeah, 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 I think, I guess, I don't know. I just started spitting, spitting ideas out there. So I think, I guess, yeah. I like to, uh, <laughs> I like to talk to my students about uh, the studio as being the safe space to, to make those horrible paintings. And yeah. um, I think one thing that, that they don't really realize, at least uh, younger generations kind of coming up, especially coming from a social media world where everything is curated. Oh, um, totally. They're not seeing not only in their life, kind of everything happening behind the scenes, but in the studio, what the artist puts out isn't necessarily everything that happens within that studio. Right, right. And it's uh, so interesting yeah. to me. It's true, and I do think that's a that's a problem in a lot of ways. This idea that you only present this polished notion. I love to. I loved. I I I enjoy um, how social media, especially in the last year, has still made me still feel connected to people and and the kinds of you know conversation starters in the same way that like stories give where I get to see like what other people are working on and it's not just their like final whitewashed beautiful painting on their grid but like yeah I got this mess going on in the studio and seeing people's palettes and seeing people you know seeing all the stuff behind the work is so much more interesting than just seeing you know the finished piece but I I had the same kind of experience I had a professor in undergrad I think I was at the studio late at night and I, I had a really lucky, a really great undergrad program at Virginia Tech because it was a small art program. And so the few people that were really interested that they, it's like the professors, oh, they, they knew who were going to be lifers, right? Like who mm -hmm. was going to really be, be continue. And like, I think I had my sophomore year, like a, a beautiful lofted studio space, <clears throat> like to paint. And I was there late at night. I think it was either my junior sophomore year or junior year and I was working and I was stay I had taken the painting out because I this is always a thing like I need to get it out of my studio just in a different space and it was just in the hallway and I was mm -hmm. sitting on the floor and I was looking at this still life it wasn't you know it was, it was just a yeah I was, whatever it was just here I was looking at this painting and I was like I and this professor walked by and it was in the evening like it was like maybe nine or ten o'clock at night and and he walked up and he was like, what's wrong? You're, you're not happy. You can tell you're seemingly really stressed out about this. And it's, it's painting. You know, you gotta, you know, you're young. Every, you got the whole life ahead of you. And he's like, you could just see it in his eyes that he was like, oh, come on, honey. Like, this is okay. And I remember just being like, no, like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. I must have just been having one of those, like, moments in which you're having so much self-doubt because mm -hmm. we all have it like I oh, I yeah. know that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life but I, I we, we have self-doubt like we, it's there and it, it, it shows its itself you know in the the best and worst of times but he he just looked at me and he's like and he flipped the thing around and he's like you just need a garbage painting and I remember saying like, what are you like I was like what and he's like a garbage painting like and he just he said that to me you need a garbage painting and he and and he had to then explain to me he was like you just need to make something and not give a shit about what it is like just to make this thing. that was the that was that probably should be my best piece of advice that I have <laughs> to offer is is that was changing for me because it finally gave me this permission to be like oh like yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. I'm not defined by everything that not nobody's defined by one thing that you know we do. So that that's 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 huge, and we should all be telling young people that that it's not all polished. Nobody's interested at the end of the day in in just the you know the perfect curation. But be people, you know. So you have a uh, solo show coming up. I do. Yes, I'm very yeah. excited. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's at. Um, in Kensington, Maryland at a space called Pazzo Fine Art. And it's up December 6th, I think is hopefully an opening. I mean, I know that with COVID and everything that who knows what will go down, but a socially distant, safe sort of like 
um, opening on Sunday and then it'll be up through February 6th. So a lot of time for people to make appointments, hopefully to go in and see three, I believe, three, three and a half years of my work all in one space. It's a great feeling. It's, um, I'm so grateful to be able to work with them. Um, they've just been really, really, really wonderful. Um, I've got, I think they're, we're printing a gorgeous catalog um, and Alex Epstein wrote a beautiful essay for it. So I'm very excited um, to share that with people. And um, yeah, so hope everybody makes it to that, it'll be <laughs> awesome. And if people are looking to find your work elsewhere, where can they, where can they find it? Um, I guess I am on social media. I'm pretty active on social media, especially in like the 24 hour story thing. I try to, I try to, to post often. I don't post as often in my grid, but um, I'm on social media on Instagram. And yeah, I guess that's it. That's a come to go to the show, go to the solo show. <laughs> so I'm so excited to have the show because um it's been a while since I've seen all of my work like that. It's been mm -hmm. all come to fruition like that. It's really exciting. So yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Kate, I think that's the perfect, uh, perfect note to end on. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me and, and, and giving me this opportunity to talk with everybody. Oh so, yeah. Um, everybody make sure you check out Kate's work and I will see you next week for our next episode. All right. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>